when you take a look at oil, sort of range bound 40 to 60, what's your call on energy stocks that are in some ways pricing in a higher oil price? Well, I think we've seen a massive recovery in energy stocks overall coming out of that massive price cut. And I do think that, you know, the ones that are still here and, and ready to go are just going to see a lot of upside flowing straight through from any addition to the price from this point on. So it's going to be, I think, a big tailwind for energy prices, but uh, for, for stock prices. Um, you know, what we always want to think about is what is the implication on the broader economy as well of those higher energy prices and to the extent to which those start biting into consumer wallets, right, you're going to have to look at both sides of that equation. So, you know, we'll have to see how this plays out. I, I guess I'm a little skeptical personally that we're going to see anything grind significantly higher over 55. I mean, that would be a big, big, big move. Well, definitely for sure, especially when you wind up seeing a deal and you're seeing uh, WTI still below 50 and that curve has just been decimated uh, along the next two years. So, Mark, how does that feed into the reflation story? When you do have, we talked about before, China weakness in the data, and then if you have oil, that's not going to really be able to sustain above 50. Sure. Well, that's why I think that's happened is that the uh, we usually think of the uh, U.S. interest rate market being sensitive to oil through the sort of the inflation knock on. But we're really seeing that become decoupled, that the uh, the U.S. 10 year yield is still f fairly low despite this recovery in oil prices. And even if we get that uh, fifty five dollars a barrel for oil, I think that we still have what's going to drive treasuries is what's happening with inflation. And we're going to see that again with the PCE, the core PCE, because one of the interesting things happening that had driving up U.S. inflation had been a uh, rents shelter. And those prices are beginning to come off. And so we're likely to see uh, lower core inflation, uh, maybe the lowest for the year when we get the PCE reading later this month. And that's going to offset this uh, rise of energy prices. So how does that work, Anne, from the Fed's point of view? Core versus nominal. Because when the oil goes up, nominal goes up. But the other prices are not coming up. How does that affect the Fed's decision making? Well, I think the Fed is really looking at that intersection of sort of sustainability of labor growth and inflation. And I got to say, one of the things we keep looking at is, and, and you pointed to this in the numbers that came out last week, right? It is, it is puzzlingly low right now. And, you know, the question is, are these transmission mechanisms that we all studied and, and you know, figured were rules of law, right? Um, Im immutable laws, um, are they working differently these days? Is there something new about the economy with labor mobility? Um, and, and maybe it's, you know, the dot-com situation, maybe it's, you know, there's just so many pressures on, on wages and keeping a lid on that. You wonder if anything is going to flow through into labor. And if, if, it doesn't, if it doesn't end up showing up in labor, eventually, you know, you can look at core versus uh, nominal. And it, does it actually matter that much? Because if you don't get that bubbling through into the broader economy, I think that's going to be a real problem. The data point on Friday fascinated me. It was only a marginal downside miss. A marginal downside yep. surprise on CPI excluding food and energy, but the market reaction suggested it was something else. The dollar was weaker, Treasury yields grinded lower as well. What was the big read from the data? Was it about the trajectory of things over the last few months? I think there was a combination of that, plus you also have there's other inflation measures. And uh, Friday we also got University of Michigan's consumer confidence, where they have the inflation measure for the long-term inflation. That fell back to its cyclical low as well as you look at like the shape of the U.S. yield curve, big flattening of the yield curve, all these things pointing to a view that the U.S. economy might not be getting the kind of lift that we thought it would be getting and that prices aren't as sticky as we thought they would be. Okay, Ann, I want to come back to this question of the consumer uh, because uh, obviously a lot of the U.S. economy is driven by the consumer. Is it right that when oil prices go up, really the consumer does not spend as much? Because when it came down, we did not see a big jump up in, in, in consumer spending. We did some research on that, and that, that is the big mystery because you certainly saw the bite when oil back, went back up, right, that, that first big leg back up. Um, you really did see the bite, and it, it, people are saving a little more. Balance sheets are stronger, um, and, and maybe you're seeing some of that trickle out in other places like those higher rents that are now starting to stabilize, but uh, that, that was, again, a big puzzle. And, and I guess the question we keep asking ourselves as we think about where we want to be putting risk capital to work is what, what's changed a little bit in this economy? Like it's never always new, but, but it's something does seem a little different this time. Uh, we're actually